Well, if you have your Bible, we want to continue now in just our study here in the book of Mark. And if you have a Bible, you can turn over to chapter 1 is where we will be, be, be uh, studying this morning. As you're turning, I was reminded this week as I was preparing for the message of a field trip that I chaperoned last May <clears throat> for my youngest son, Joe. I love history, and in third grade, at least at Deer Ridge, I think most, most third graders uh, go through, at least in Fort Wayne, go through Fort Wayne history, and so we took a walking tour of downtown. This is, I think, the third or fourth time I've done that, and uh, it's uh, really exciting just to go around and see and hear the different stories, look at the historical markers, I'm kind of weird that way, but looking at historical markers just to see different things that have happened in Fort Wayne, and so part of the, the, the one thing that was different this year than in years past was that we were able to go to the embassy, and we not only were able to sit in the auditorium and kind of hear different things about the pipe organ and different facts about that, but then they let us come up on stage and actually go, go downstairs into the basement where the, the dressing rooms are. And kind of, they told us stories about everything down there. And what was really cool is one of the people, the volunteers that take you around and, and show you the, uh, the theater, one of the volunteers was my fifth grade teacher from Huntertown Elementary. So it's kind of cool to uh, be able to see her. Um, so they walked us around, and uh, we were able to tour that, and, and just to see um, history from a different perspective. You know, I've been to the embassy multiple times, but have never, never seen the building from that perspective to be able to go downstairs and uh, see what's happening there. So I share that experience because I was thinking, and I want you to be thinking, about a time when you were able to gain access to some behind-the-scenes information or kind of a sneak peek where, where the curtain is kind of drawn back and you're able to see information that you wouldn't have normally seen. For me, this experience of, of going to the embassy, I was able to see information I didn't know about the embassy, uh, going down in the basement, seeing those uh, dressing rooms down in the basement. If you've never had an experience like that, well then, today is your day because Mark here in these first 13 verses of chapter 1 is in essence giving us a sneak peek or a preview of the most important things that he wants those who are reading this book to understand about the gospel as well as Jesus himself. And so as we're, we're making, through these, making our way through these verses this morning, Mark is going to be using Jesus' baptism and his temptation in the wilderness as really as a lens through which he is wanting us to, to interpret the rest of what we see in the next 16 chapters. So these are the, the lens that he's wanting us to use to interpret based on what we see regarding Jesus in these first 13 chapter, uh, verses to help us to gain a perspective. And in particular, we see we're going to be looking at two declarations that, that are made regarding Jesus that, Luke, or, I'm sorry, that Mark records for us. And with that behind-the-scenes information, he is wanting us to be able to, to interpret really from a perspective that the people who are living in this Circumstance aren't able, they don't, have, uh, they don't have the access to that immediately. So, so we want to, to, to be able to, to understand that you're kind of in a sense putting, <clears throat> excuse me, putting on glasses to be able to look at this gospel in a way that the people who were living it didn't necessarily have access to. So if you have a Bible, take it and turn with me to Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read the, uh, all 13 verses. We looked at verses 1 through 8 last week. Um, but I would ask that you join me in standing as we honor the reading of God's word this morning. Verses 1 through 13 of chapter 1, where Mark writes these words under the inspiration of the Spirit. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 4, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit." Verse 9, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved Son and you I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness 
And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Let me ask you to join me as we pray and ask God's blessing upon our time this morning as we spend time looking at this passage. Lord, as we come again to you, to you our desire would be that you would incline our hearts toward you. Lord, incline our hearts, as, as the psalmist said in Psalm 119, incline our hearts to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Lord, there's much that we could be thinking about this morning during this time, during these minutes that we'll be examining your word. And we pray that you would bring about in our hearts a growing affection and, and an interest <clears throat> that is not our own. Lord, we need you to fan that flame in our hearts for a greater desire to see and know you. So use this as fuel, Lord, our time this morning. Use it as fuel to feed that growing passion for you to live in submission to what your word says, to excite a, a joy that is not manufactured by our own heart. Lord, thank you that you are at work in us this morning and bringing us here and giving us a desire to seek you. So we praise you, Spirit, for your work. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. We thank you, Father, for the declaration that sinners can be declared righteous before you because of the work of your Son. So help us, Lord, this morning to apply your word. In Jesus' name, to a, amen. You may be seated. Well, I want you to see as we look at these first 13 verses as really taking place away from the hustle and bustle of what we see happening in the remainder of, this, of these chapters. In essence, it's kind of the beginning. This prologue is a time where Mark brings Jesus aside. He, he begins in chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, in describing what we see regarding John the Baptist. But including now, starting in, in verse 9, we, we, are, we are brought into the wilderness there with Jesus. And we are given information about him that, as I said, is important for the remainder of this gospel. But it's also important because once we hit verse 14, Mark is, in essence, inviting us to join him on the express train called the Gospel of Mark. And he's going to be displaying Jesus in the ever-busy context of real life. We're going to plop into Galilee and follow Jesus along the path all the way leading up to chapter 16 when he's at the cross and he resurrected. So in these first 13 verses, it's kind of we're getting our breath and understanding some of the important things that Mark wants us to see before we jump in and are able to see the disciples struggling and others who were following after Jesus wrestling with trying to understand who this Jesus is who has come and doing all of these things. We are given really a heavenly perspective in contrast to those who are, who are living out these events in the remaining chapters. As you hopefully remember from last week if you were with us, the title in verse 1, we see Mark giving us the identity of Jesus and really the focus of the book this is the beginning, Mark is saying, the beginning of the gospel, of the proclamation of good news. We remember the, the, the word gospel is the idea where, where you have a messenger coming back from a battle bringing good news of what's taken place, that victory has taken place. And so this is the beginning of the announcement of the victory that's possible through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that Christ isn't Jesus' last name. It, it, it means Messiah. He, he is Messiah, the, the one who was prophesied who would come as the deliverer of, of God's people. But he's more than that. We also noted that he is the son of God. He is divine. He's the one who is, who is coming with this divine authority who, who is the fulfillment of what we saw in the Old Testament that, that narrowly began with the Israelites. It narrowed down to the king, even further to the remnant, and now to a person. And, G, and Mark is saying, that son of God that you are looking for is Jesus Christ. He comes with authority, but he also comes as a servant who is willing to serve to the point of death. And we see ultimately what kind of son he, of God he is, because those prior son of gods have all failed. Mark is here describing for us the son of God ultimately as a son who would die, but be resurrected. And we see again this word son of God being come, coming back to the forefront when the centurion makes proclamation of who Jesus is. So Mark begins with this, this statement in verse 1 of this declaration of who Jesus is. But then he, flows the, he fleshes that out because we have the, the proclamation 
of good news beginning in verse, chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, with the prophecy being spoken in the Old Testament, that's what we noted in verses 2 and 3 where Mark quotes Isaiah where he says, there is a messenger who is going to be coming to prepare the way, a voice crying in the wilderness. And so we see that this prophecy then is fulfilled in, in part by John the Baptist. He is the one, this messenger, who is coming ahead of time to prepare the way for the coming of Messiah. And we noted last week that, that John's ministry, he is, he is described as coming in the spirit of Elijah in multiple ways, but the ones we looked at in particular were just the way that he dressed himself. Both Elijah and John wore animal hair, animals' hair. And the message that, that John is bringing is a message of repentance, of calling God's people back to himself in preparation for this coming one. And so we see that the second prophecy is also this proclamation of good news begins with the prophecy given in the Old Testament and Isaiah. Obviously, there are multiple other prophecies given, but Mark just quotes this one. And it continues with this prophecy being fulfilled through John the Baptist and now, starting in verse 9, through Jesus. So look with me again at, at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So coming on the heels of Mark's quotation of Isaiah 2 and 3 and saying there, that there's this one who's going, to be, who's going to be sent to prepare the way of the Lord and we know that Mark tells us that that person is John the Baptist. He has fulfilled this role of the messenger. But that leaves open the question, okay, well, who then should we anticipate is going to show up next? And if, if hopefully by now, as we've read this multiple times, the expectation is one, not only John says, is one who will be mightier than me, that I'm not worthy to untie even the, the, the thong of a sandal. And Isaiah tells us even more clearly that, we are to make, that he is to make ready the way of the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 3. And that's, that is the expectation here is that Yahweh himself will come. So as we're reading along, if you were reading this in that first century, you'd be reading, and who, who, is the expect, who, who are we expecting is going to show up? The Lord, right? That's who we were expecting is going to show up. Well, Mark is saying, in those days, in the days that John the Baptist was ministering, and we should be expecting the arrival of the Lord, of Yahweh, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Who shows up? Well, this man named Jesus, who's coming from Nazareth and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As readers, Mark is conveying important information to us behind-the-scenes information about who this man is and helping us answer that question, who is this guy? And so as we look at this section of Scripture, as I said, there are two declarations that are made. Starting in verse 9, we see the first declaration is that the baptism of Jesus was a declaration of favor. But certainly that's not what the readers as well as the Jews would have expected from a man described this way. Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. In other words, Jesus comes from nowhere. And I say nowhere because of the dim view that those in southern Israel would have had toward their brethren in the north. If you remember your, Israel, uh, your, your Jewish history, there was a united kingdom back under King Saul and King David and King Solomon. But once Solomon, King Solomon died, the nation broke apart into the northern and southern areas. And as you fast forward to Jesus' time, you have really a, a nation that's divided in the south. You can see Judea, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, those cities down there. Samaria splits between them, and that's the people who, who compromised by commingling with the foreigners who came in during the first, when the ten tribes were taken away, when they were taken into captivity. And so they, the, the Assyrians brought in uh, the Babylonians brought in the, the uh, foreigners who, who intermingled with those who were in Samaria, the Jews who were still there. And so we have then this, these people that were rejected by the Israelites. Go on farther north, you have the area of Galilee. This is where Jesus is from, Nazareth of Galilee. You can see the city there. And so Jesus is from an area where those in the south would have viewed with great suspicion because they had been separated from the south. They weren't quite as bad as the Sumerians, but certainly they were, were ones that were to be held in suspicion. And we see, I think, the importance of this riff even in the outline of the gospel. 
If you remember last week how the outline works, you have the introduction, these first 13 verses, and then there are three acts. Three, it's a drama in three acts, you could say, where, where Mark takes us then, each in a, a different geographic area. The beginning is in Galilee. The first eight chapters are there taking place. And, and how do the people respond to the proclamation of Jesus' message? Well, not everybody agree, uh, receives him, but in general, there is an affirmative response of the people in this area. Mark contrasts that response with the final act that we see taking place in Jerusalem in verse, chapters 11 through 16, where Jesus comes to Jerusalem and, and ultimately faces a very hostile crowd who ultimately demands his execution. So Mark's first readers, as they're looking at these words, as they're seeing, the expectation here is that Yahweh is going to come and instead we have this Jesus character who is from Nazareth of Galilee, they, they immediately recognize the tension and stigma that Jesus would have carried as his ministry begins. And so based on his background, the last person the Jews would have expected to experience the favor of God would have been Jesus. But here we have in this section a declaration that Jesus does possess the favor of God. And so not only are we told that he is from Nazareth in Galilee, but we're also told that he was baptized by John. Now, already we've heard why people were coming out to be baptized by John. If you look back in verses 4 through 8, you'll see that Mark tells us that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. That the Israelites were coming out and they were confessing their sins in preparation for this one that John was saying was coming in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40. So everyone who underwent John's baptism did it to express their, their submission to the truth that they didn't measure up morally before a holy and righteous God. That's why they were going out there. They were, they, they were convicted. They knew that they didn't measure up. And so they're coming to prepare themselves to confess their sins, we're told in those verses earlier in 4 through 8. So this is a declaration of agreement with the truth that they had sinned and were rightly deserving of God's judgment. That's where we see this, this initial baptism. So along comes Jesus, and he too now, we're told, is going to get baptized by John, which should cause us to scratch our heads and say, well, why? Why, why would he do that? Right? We're given inside information. We've already seen in verse 1, who is this Jesus? He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Why in the world? Why in the world would he come as an expression of agreement with God that he, he was a sinner? Well, that's where we have to understand this, I think, a little bit better to, to recognize what's happening here. So in order to understand Jesus' baptism, we need to see that John's baptism of Jesus was also an expression of submission on the part of Jesus. And he was doing this, I think, in order to express his agreement with the Father that Jesus had and w always would not fail, but instead measure up to the Father's will for him while he lived on this earth. Jesus' baptism by John was meant to show us as readers that Jesus in his human nature lived in active submission to the Father's will in every way. He didn't come in an attitude of repentance. He was coming in an act, attitude of submission in confessing that he never would fail the Lord. That makes Jesus unique, right? He, he would never fail. Therefore, he, this baptism is a declaration of favor upon Jesus. And it's not by accident what takes place next in the narrative. So Jesus, uh, Mark is writing this, Jesus from Nazareth comes and he is baptized by John in the Jordan. And as we're, we're looking at these verses, what do we see take place then as we're looking at these verses? Let me just turn over to our passage here. was baptized by John in the Jordan, verse 10, immediately coming up out of the water. What happens next? He saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him and, your, and a voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. It's not by accident that right after he is baptized by John, I believe is a, an expression of submission on Jesus' part to say, Father, I am going, I'm living in active obedience not only today but in the future and always to your will for me. And how does the Father respond? Well, the Father gives a declaration of favor upon him. The Father's favor is identi it further identifies the kind of son of God that Jesus is. In this, in this description here in verses 10 through 11, this was not a baptism of repentance for Jesus. Rather, it was a baptism of confessing that Jesus was and always would live in submission to the Father's will for him. 
And so here the Father is saying, you are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Again, not by accident that this takes place right after the baptism. Right? There is no, there's no need for repentance on the part of Jesus because he has not sinned. That's why he experiences the favor. He is fully obedient to the will of the Father up to this point. And Jesus is saying, that will continue. And that's part of what the Gospel of Mark is. We're going to now follow, get on the Gospel train, right, to follow this along and see how this is going to be fulfilled in these next 16 chapters. To see that Jesus is deserving of the favor of the Father because he does not fail. Verse 10, immediately coming out of the water, he saw, Jesus saw the heavens opening. It's interesting here, the, the New American Standards translation of this seems kind of, uh, kind of, it's not, the word behind this, the Greek word behind it, if you have the ESV, it's translated, he saw, Jesus saw the heavens being torn open. That's a little more, a little more graphic, right? That, that this, this word has more of that flavor. New King James, he saw the heavens parting. New Living Translation, Jesus saw the heavens splitting apart. In other words, here Jesus, Mark, is, is trying to convey to us as readers that there is something supernatural taking place, that th this is being ripped apart, the heavens are being ripped apart as a supernatural divine act. And we only see this word used one other time in the Gospels by Mark. And if you fast forward to the end, chapter 15, that's where we see it, is when, when Mark uses it at the end of the book to signify another divine act, this time taking place in the temple. And it's there, Mark uses it to describe the tearing of the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. There, that tearing of the veil from top to bottom. Again, another divine act. And the purpose at the beginning of the book, I think, is to send the message that this is a divine act. That Jesus is seeing this, the heavens parting. It's, it's the act of the Father. And what does he do? He sends the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, upon Jesus as, again, another act of divine favor being displayed. So as readers, we, this is all piling up, and, and Mark is writing it from the perspective that who is seeing this take place, right? He's in the wilderness, there are people around, but who's seeing this? Well, Mark's writing it, just Jesus is seeing it, and us as we're reading it. So we're given this inside information to say, this is who this Jesus is. Join me on the gospel train as we now, we're going to follow on, and you're going to put these, this is the lens through which you're going to evaluate and interpret what we see moving forward into the next several chapters. This Jesus is the one who has received the favor of God. And he has received it because he is worthy. He, there is no need of repentance in his life. He is always faithful. And we hear then that declaration from the voice of God and the person of the Father declaring that this Jesus is, is his beloved Son. That he is, God the Father is well pleased with him. It's interesting as well that this, this declaration of favor should point us, and maybe you think of this declaration that took place back in Genesis chapter 1. At the end of the sixth day, after God had created his, his crowning achievement in Adam, after God made Adam in his own image, we read these words in Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made. Now prior to this, he had, he, on the previous days, he had said, it is good. He declared it, it was good. But on the sixth day, at the end of the sixth day, he said, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. This declaration that it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. In other words, in this declaration, I think we see God's declaration that he was well pleased with Adam. But in contrast to Adam, in this declaration that we see be taking place here at Jesus' baptism, Jesus is the Son of God who maintained the Father's favor. In contrast to Adam, who ultimately failed by sinning, we as readers are given this sneak peek that this time things, things would be different. As we, as we move forward and then in, into the gospel, we're going to see that there is reason why God the Father declared favor upon the Son. And so as we, as we pause here, though, just to consider this truth, I think it's important for at least two reasons to stop. First, just from the perspective of thinking about the gospel itself, Jesus here has, has received and maintained the Father's favor, and the reality is that, that none of us, none of us are worthy of that declaration. 
Like Adam, we have all failed. We have morally dishonored God. But the hope we have as we continue on this path, on the, the rails of, the, of, this, of this book, we will see that those who don't have favor can receive favor through faith in what this, what this Jesus, what this Jesus Christ, this God, this Son of God would do for sinners like you and me. And so the hope we have is this favor that the, fa- that the Father bestowed upon the Son can be given to sons and daughters who are adopted into God's family through faith in what His Son did. Well, we'll see that as we continue on in Mark. But secondly, I want you to see as well that this is, I think, important, an important thing to recognize as well, this declaration of favor upon Jesus for just our Christian growth. Because the reality is we, we need help in interpreting our lives, and, and especially as the difficulties that come tempt us to think things that aren't true. Certainly as we follow along Jesus' life, in these 16 chapters, we will see him encountering some very difficult situations, obviously culminating on the cross itself. But as readers, Mark is wanting us to not forget what is declared about Jesus by God the Father who's in control of all these things. He declares Jesus to be a beloved son, and in Jesus, the Father is well pleased. So as, as, as I, as a Christ follower, as you as a follower of Christ, who've experienced the forgiveness for our sins through faith in him, this is what we have to filter all that we're facing through this same grid. In other words, if Jesus experienced difficulty, but it was all for good, then I too can maintain an attitude of hope, and so can you, because we know God will turn all that we're experiencing for good in the end. That's what we see with Jesus. He has has been granted, he has been, the, the declaration of favor has been given, And it's through that lens then that we interpret every other bad thing that happens to Jesus. And if I'm in Christ, by grace through faith, that what he did, that I know that God is for me and not against me. No matter what I'm experiencing, no matter what tomorrow might bring, what difficulty or trial or tribulation, this is the lens through which I must interpret my life. So as Mark continues in verse 12, he says, he, we see this now, the, the second declaration is going to be made starting in, in verse 12 and 13. The first is the declaration of favor that Jesus receives at his baptism. Verses 12 and 13, immediately the Spirit impelled him, Jesus, to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. I want you to see here there are two opposing sides as Jesus makes his way into the wilderness. There is Jesus on the one side, Jesus and the Spirit, as well as the angels. And in some ways, this is a declaration of battle, of warfare that will take place now in the beginning with Jesus ministering and moving forward. On the other side, you have Satan, the wild beasts and the desolate landscape, the wilderness that they're in. Mark doesn't share all the details that we find in the other Gospels here. He doesn't share what Satan did to Jesus in tempting him. He he doesn't share how Jesus responded with Scripture to the attacks that Satan brings. But I think there is enough enough evidence here that that Mark is, is is bringing to us this declaration that the temptation of Jesus was a declaration of faithfulness. We see that initially here in the wilderness. And Mark is, I think, purposefully vague because as we continue in the gospel, we're going to see his faithfulness be maintained until the cross where we see it culminate in his greatest act of faithfulness that affected not only him, but every follower of him as well. Initially, verse, 10, uh, sorry, verse 12, immediately, and Mark uses, likes to use this word immediately. You'll see it, I think, 40 times in the gospel. It, it, it isn't like, like ooh, right, you know, right then, it happened. You know, it's kind of more Mark likes to use it as a sense of, well, then. You know, it's kind of like this progression that he's using. Well, the next thing that happened, then. So immediately, the Spirit impelled him to go out to the wilderness. And I think the reason we see Jesus being impelled, and I think the reason why Mark uses this is to compel, or is to communicate, rather, this idea that 
because reading it, it kind of sounds like the Spirit is even against him, right? He's kind of impelling, or, or it, it, that, that word kind of has, it implies a sense of force that like Jesus was maybe didn't want to go. Well, that wasn't the case. I think what it's, what it's being used to describe here is Mark is using it because he recognizes, Mark recognizes the significance of the temptation that Jesus did undergo. This wasn't just some minor thing. The sad fact for each of us is that we have never experienced temptation to the nth degree because we always give in. We've, we've never experienced temptation to the nth degree where sin is conquered. Here, Jesus has experienced sin to a level that we can't really even imagine. Right? It's turned up exponentially as he goes. And, and so Jesus, we, we have the sense as Mark is writing, Jesus was impelled and there's a sense where, where the Spirit, now the Spirit is with him, but, but it kind of seems that the Spirit is, is even against him because why would, why, would, why would anybody want Jesus to go and, and do battle? Well, because that's part of the reason why he came, right? The will of the Father was that he would, he would vanquish sin and death. And so as Jesus is, is impelled out, he is impelled out into the wilderness. He is doing battle in the wilderness. And the, Mark is careful to describe that in that wilderness, this desolate place, there were, not only was he being tempted by Satan, but he was with the wild beasts. Interesting that all the things he could describe out there, that he describes this, he chooses to include these words and I think part of that is to, to recognize the reality of the world, the fallen world that we live in. It is a very dangerous place. Right? There, there are animals, I mean, um, it's amazing that anybody gets in water. You, know, you think about all of the, you know, the ocean is filled with deadly things. Rivers, I mean, lakes, right? All kinds of deadly things. And here Mark, I think, is reminding us that not only is there is there the landscape that is against him because the landscape is against us. Right? In a fallen world, the, the, the animals that should be for us are against us. The creation is against us. And Jesus experienced that here. And we don't know exactly what happened there, but, but Mark is telling us that part of this, this battle that was taking place in the wilderness was that he was with the wild beasts. This was an untamed area. He's now apart from people, further into the wilderness area. And we know that he's doing, obviously, battle with Satan as Satan is repeatedly tempting him. But ultimately, I think what we need to recognize here is that in the midst of this, Jesus sustained obedience. He sustained obedience in the face of fierce temptation in contrast to Adam and Israel's failures. And I say that because of what Mark also includes here. Right, this, is, this is the beginning of the, the proclamation of Jesus not only his favor, but his faithfulness, and we'll see that as we continue in the book of Mark, but, but here I think Mark is even helping us see the contrast because he is there in the wilderness 40 days. And if we think about 40 now, it wasn't 40 days, but 40 years that the Israelites were in the wilderness because they failed to live in obedience to what God's will was for them, to take the promised land. So in contrast to Adam and Moses and these Israelites, Jesus remained faithful to the Father's will throughout these temptations as well as, and this is where kind of Mark leaves it open, would he be faithful as he continues on? And the implication is, or the, the implied response or answer is, yes, he will be faithful, and you'll see how he will be faithful in the face of ongoing temptation. Because it's, it's Jesus' faithfulness that gives us hope, right? Who, who is this Jesus? Who is this one who came and who received the favor of God? Well, he is the one who is faithful to the end. He is faithful as you read this. He's kind of the hook. He's pulling you in to say, will he be faithful? Well, he is faithful all the way to the end. Even to the cross, even to the point of death, he is faithful to the end. And obviously, we've read the story. We know the end of the story. But we also know that, that we are not faithful. And as we think about the, the application of this, at least one of the applications of this section, 
is that his faithfulness can be ours. As we continue reading this, we find that Jesus conquers sin and death at the cross. He rises again from the dead in order that sinners like you and me can receive that forgiveness that's found as we place our faith in the one who bore the wrath that we rightly deserve. Mark is reminding us that Jesus was faithful and because he was faithful without an absence of sin, he is uniquely qualified to take as the God-man, as fully God, fully human, to take the wrath that we deserve. And so the call then is a call to faith, to believe, to say, is that a, is that a true and honest offer that he gives to sinners who are condemned to experience the wrath of God and instead the hope we have is Jesus rose, he, he conquered sin and death and for all who place their faith and trust in him, they can know forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God. So these declarations by Mark about Jesus are meant to be used as this lens through which we interpret all that happens moving forward because as we see, some in Galilee are receiving him, some are not, but we continually see these Pharisees, this religious elite who are saying they want to kill him. They reject him. But we've seen already that he's received God's favor. We've already seen that he is the faithful one. And so we're left with the question, how will you respond? That's really what Mark is moving toward as we move to the end. How will you respond? Will you, will you respond like the Pharisees? Or will you respond like the centurion who said, surely this man was the son of God, or this man is the son of God? So my encouragement is that as we continue along this gospel train that we will be using this, these, this lens of interpretation to see this Jesus, this glorious one, this Jesus Christ, the true Son of God, who rightly fulfilled every requirement of the law in order that sinners could know forgiveness. So as we close this morning, I mentioned that response card. Let me encourage you to take that back out as we just ask some questions on the back and thinking about how God might have us respond this morning to this section of Scripture. I would encourage you, if you, if you don't have a reading plan, uh, they're out in the foyer. It's in the book of Mark. We're reading through the book of Mark a section at a time through uh, Easter. And there's a journal out there as well. You can start at the beginning if you want. We're, I think, just into chapter three or four. But you can start again. I would encourage you to be reading through Mark as we're going to be studying it in, in more detail. Not as quickly as what the reading plan is, but if you have your, that response card on the back, Father, I, I, I'm celebrating the favor that Jesus earned for me. Here is, if you have cried out to Christ as your Savior, then you can celebrate this. I'm celebrating that Jesus earned for me this favor and became mine. It became mine when, by his grace, I professed, faith as his, professed him as my Savior. Thank you that your favor is not dependent upon my ability to rightly perform and maintain it. Right? We are, our, our salvation is rooted in the, the work of Christ. Secondly, you can respond, Jesus, I'm praising you for your faithfulness as you were tempted to the final degree, yet you were without sin. Thank you for the hope that your faithfulness provides to me each, each day. And I would just challenge you to be thinking about these two declarations, favor and faithfulness, this week and thinking more deeply about them. Lastly, pastor, please contact me as I have questions about how I can know this forgiveness of sin that Jesus promises to all who, who repent and believe. That's where you are. You've maybe been here multiple times or this is your first time, but you're honestly, God is beginning to work in your heart and cause you to think about, seriously, about spiritual things. If that's where you are, please just check that last circle and I'll contact you. We can get, to, get together and I can help you to understand how you can know forgiveness for your sin through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust you've been encouraged this morning as we've spent time looking at God's word. I'm going to pray and we'll have a final song, take up our offering, but again, this doesn't stop our time of reflecting upon what we've seen. Let's pray together. Lord, as we've come, as you've thankfully have brought us together this morning, as we've looked at the final verses in this first section of your prologue in the Gospel of Mark. Lord, I thank you for the, this revelation that we have regarding Jesus. This Jesus who in our world today is re rejected regularly 
This Jesus that many in this room have professed faith in, Lord, we, we thank you for this truth that we have seen. And I pray that it would be an encouragement as we think of the favor that is ours through faith in your Son, Lord Jesus, or in, your, in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that that, that helps us to interpret Lord, the circumstances that, that our lives experience. Lord, that we must view and understand our lives through this lens of, of favor granted, even on our darkest day, Lord. We know that you are working out your good purposes. We thank you as well for your faithfulness, Lord, to the ultimate degree that you never wavered. We thank you that this is one, this is one example, one snapshot of your ministry on earth that, that was absent of sin. Lord, we know we, we were consciously aware of our own sin. We're thankful, Lord, for those who have received forgiveness for that through faith in you. I pray for those who are here this morning, Lord, who, who honestly cannot say, yeah, I, I'm confident that my sins have been forgiven. Lord, I pray that you would move in them, Lord, to check that last circle that I would be able to speak with them to give them the hope that's found through faith in you. Help us, Lord, to sing these, the, the words of this final song with joy, for you are great and mighty. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen.